Section 17 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 9, Vespasian, A.D. 69-79, to 79, Part 1. The Flavian family, to which the next three emperors belonged, was of no high descent. It was said, indeed, though Suetonius could find no evidence for the story, that Vespasian's great-grandfather was a day-laborer of Umbria, who came each year to work in the hire of a Sabine farmer, till at last he settled at Riate. His father had been a tax-gatherer in Asia, and had taken afterwards to the money-lender's trade, and dying, left a widow with two sons, Sabinus and Vespasianus. The younger showed in early life no high ambition, did not care even to be a senator, and was only brought to sue for honours by the taunts and entreaties of his mother. Fortune did not seem to smile on him at first. Caligula was angry because the streets were foul when he was ideal, and had his bosom plastered with mud. He proved his valour as a soldier in many a battlefield in Germany and Britain, but fell into disgrace again because his patron was Narcissus, on whose friends Agrippina looked askance. Then he rose to be governor of Africa, and was too fair not to give offence. But his worst danger was from Nero's vanity, which he sorely wounded by going to sleep while he was singing, or by leaving the party altogether. Shunning the court, he lived in quiet, till the rising in Judea made Nero think of him again as a general of tried capacity, yet too modest and unambitious to be feared. By his energy and valour he soon restored discipline and won the soldier's trust, and was going on vigorously with the work of conquest when the news came of Nero's fall. His son Titus set out to pay his compliments to Galba, and possibly to push his fortunes at the court. But hearing at Corinth that Galba too had fallen, and that Otho was in his place, he sailed back at once to join his father. Vespasian's friends now thought that the time was come for him to strike a blow for empire. The two rivals who were quarrelling for the prize were men of infamous character and no talents for command, while the legions of the east trusted their generals and were jealous of the western armies. The rumour was spread among them that they were to be shifted from their quarters to the rigour of the German frontier, to let others reap the fruits of war, and they began to clamour for an emperor of their own. Mucianus, the governor of Syria, might have been a formidable rival, for he was brilliant and dexterous in action, of winning ways and ready speech, had moved among the highest circles, and won the affections of his soldiers. He was no friend of Vespasian, for he had coveted his post in Palestine. Yet now, from a rare prudence or self-sacrifice, or gained over, it may be, by the graceful tact of Titus, he was willing to waive all claims of personal ambition, and to share all the dangers of the movement. But Vespasian himself was slow to move. He had made his army take the oath to each emperor in turn, and he thought mainly now of the war that lay ready to his hand. The urgent pleadings of his son, the well-turned periods of Mucianus, such as Tacitus puts into his mouth, the sanguine hopes of friends might have failed to make him risk the hazard. But the soldier's talk had compromised his name. The troops at Aquileia had declared for him already, and he felt that it might be dangerous to draw back. The prefect of Egypt, with whom Titus had intrigued already, took the first decisive step, and put at Vespasian's commands his important province and the corn supplies of Rome. The armies of Palestine and Syria rose soon after and joined the movement with enthusiasm. Berenice, Agrippa's sister, who had long since gained the ear of Titus, helped him with her statecraft and brought offers of alliance from eastern princes and even from the Parthian Empire. But Vespasian was still slow and wary. While Primus Antonius pushed on with the vanguard of his army from Illyria, not staying in his adventurous haste, to hear the warning to be cautious, Mucianus followed with the main body to find the struggle almost over before he made his way to Rome. Vespasian himself crossed over into Egypt to take measures to starve his enemies into submission, 
or to hold the country as a stronghold in case of failure. There he heard of the bold march of the vanguard into Italy, of the bloody struggle near Cremona, and of the undisputed march to Rome. Then came the tidings from the northwest that the withdrawal of the legions had been followed by a rising of the neighboring races, and that even Roman troops had stooped so low as to swear fealty to Gaul. The Britons and Dacians, too, were stirring, and brigands were pillaging the undefended Pontus. Soon he learnt that the capital had been stormed and his brother killed in the blind fury of the soldiers' riot, but that vengeance had been taken in the blood of Vitellius and his troops. Each ship brought couriers with eventful news, or senators coming to do homage, till the great town of Alexandria was thronged to overflowing. Still he stayed in Egypt, till at length he could not in prudence tarry longer, for Mucianus, having set Antonius aside, was in absolute command at Rome, and his own son Domitian, a youth of seventeen, who had been left in the city but escaped his uncle's fate, seemed to have lost his head at the sudden change of fortune, and was indulging in arrogant caprices. Titus was with his father in Egypt till the last, and pleaded with him to deal tenderly with his brother's willful ways, then left to close the war in Palestine, while Vespasian hastened with the corn ships on to Rome, where the granaries had only food for ten days left, and Mucianus had been ruling with a sovereign's heirs. Meantime the rising on the Rhine was quelled. It had its source in the revengeful ambition of Cavillus, a chieftain of the ruling class of the Batavi, who had twice narrowly escaped with life from the charge of disloyalty to Rome. His people had long sent their contingents to serve beside the legions. Bold, brave, and proud of their military exploits, they were easily encouraged to believe that they could take the lead in the national movement of the Germans. The frontier had been almost stripped in the excitement of the civil war, and the scanty remnants of the legions knew not which side to join and had no confidence in their leaders. To supply the waste of war, fresh levies were demanded, and the Batavi, stung to fury by the recruiting officers, listened readily to Cavillus. They rose to arms, at first in Vespasian's name, and then throwing off the mask, frankly unfurled the national banner to which the neighboring races streamed. The Treveri and Lingones tried to play the same part among the Gauls, and to lead them too against the imperial troops, who, half-hearted and mutinying against their leaders, laid down their arms or were overpowered by numbers. Some even took the military oath, in the name of the sovereignty of Gaul. It was but an idle title, after all. The mutual jealousy between the several clans and towns barred the way to real union among them, nor would the Germans calmly yield to the pretensions of their less warlike neighbors. Soon, too, the tramp of the advancing legions was heard along the great highways, for the struggle once over at the center, no time was lost in sending Cariolus to restore order on the Rhine. The wavering loyalty of the Gauls was soon secured, and it scarcely needed the general's proclamation to remind them that the Roman Empire brought peace and safety to their homes, and that even if they could rend that union to pieces, they would be the first to suffer from its ruin. To reduce the Batavi to submission, force was needed more than words, but the strife grew more hopeless as their allies fell off, and such as still remained in arms were routed after an obstinate battle in which a river's bed was choked with the bodies of the slain. The submission of Cavillus closed an insurrection, formidable in itself, but most noteworthy as an ominous sign of the possible disruption of the empire. It was left for Vespasian on his return to heal the gaping wounds of civil war, to restore good order to the provinces, and to calm the excitement of the capital after scenes of fire and carnage, and the vicissitudes of the last eventful year which had seen three emperors rise and fall. The city was beautified again and rose with fresh grandeur from the havoc and the ruin. The temple on the capital was magnificently restored, and all the dignitaries of Rome assembled in great pomp to share in laying the foundation stone. The temple finished, they were careful to replace some at least of what had been destroyed within it. 
careful search was made for copies of the treaties laws and ancient records which had perished in the flames and three thousand were replaced as in a national museum but while the pious hands were dealing reverently with the greatest of rome's ancient temples the forces of destruction were let loose elsewhere and the prophecies of woe upon the holy city of jerusalem were nearing their fulfilment to understand the causes of the rising in judea it may be well to glance at rome's earlier relations with that country the first of her generals to conquer it was the great pompeius in sixty three b c and it was on his forcible entry into the temple that attention was directed to the religion of a people who had a shrine seemingly without a god falling with the provinces of the east to the portion of antonius judea was conferred by him as a kingdom upon herod and augustus afterwards confirmed that prince's tenure and added fresh districts to his rule for it was a settled maxim of his policy to draw a girdle of dependent kingdoms round the distant provinces and gradually to accustom hardy races to the yoke of rome in the case of the jews there seemed to be good reasons for this course they were soon known to be a stubborn people tenacious of their national customs and ready to fly to arms in their defence they were spread widely through the empire in the great cities and the marts of industry but men liked them less the more they saw them they thought them turbulent and stiff-necked and mutual prejudice prevented any real insight into national temper or any sympathy for the noble qualities of the race it is curious to read in tacitus the strange medley of gross errors about their history and creed monstrous fancies gathered from malicious gossip or reported by credulous and ignorant writers it is the more strange when we think that he must have seen hundreds of the men whose habits and beliefs he unwittingly misjudged and one of whom at least wrote in his own days to enlighten the world of letters on the subject at rome the jewish immigrants were looked upon with marked disfavour under tiberius we read that thousands of them were forcibly removed as settlers to sardinia where if they sickened of malaria as was likely it would be but a trifling loss in judea the caprices of the emperors affected them but little though they flew to arms rather than allow the statue of caligula to be set up in their temple but hard times began when under claudius the country passed from the dynasty of the herods to the rule of roman knights or freedmen it was their misfortune to be exposed to the greed or lust of men as bad as the provincial governors of the republic while zealots who mistook the times were fanning the flame of national discontent they bore with the vile felix but at length the insolence of gessius florus provoked a hasty rising in sixty six a d which spread rapidly from place to place till the whole country was in arms the general in command of syria could make no head against the insurrection which carried all before it till the strong hand of vespasian turned upon the rebels with resistless force the strong engine of roman discipline but the war which had begun in a hasty riot was persisted in with stubborn resolution towns and strongholds had to be stormed or starved into surrender till the last hopes and fanaticism of the people stood at bay within the walls of jerusalem in the lines of the besieging legions two summers passed away while thus much was being done and the third year was spent in further reaching schemes of conquest and the beleaguered city was left almost unassailed it was at this point that titus was left in sole command eager to push forward the siege and to enjoy the sweets of victory at rome but he had no easy task before him the city strong by natural position was fortified by walls of unusual breadth and height and amply supplied with water within were resolute men who had flocked thither from all sides to defend the shrine of their most sacred memories and the stronghold of freedom and whose fiery zeal swept every thought aside before their duty to their country and their god there were also others more timid or more prudent who better knew the force of rome and feared the zealot's narrow bigotry thus mutual distrust and mutual slaughter weakened the forces of defence after long months of obstinate fighting 
discipline and skill prevailed over the dogged valour of the jews the holy city was taken by storm a d seventy one and the great temple the one centre of the nation's worship was utterly destroyed it was said that titus was grieved to see the ruin of so glorious a monument of art he had no such tender feeling for his prisoners of war the outbreak which roman misgovernment had provoked had been already fearfully avenged jerusalem was left a heap of ruins and the defenders were dragged in their conqueror's train to die of misery and hardship on the way or to feed the wild beasts with their bodies at the amphitheatres of the great cities on the road to rome End of section seventeen section eighteen of roman history the early empire by william wolfe capes this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter nine vespasian a d sixty nine to seventy nine part two when the successful general returned to italy it remained only to celebrate the triumph of the war and the jewish historian josephus describes as an eyewitness the splendid pageant which was one magnificent beyond all parallel the procession of the day began at the triumphal gate through which for ages so many conquering armies had passed along in pomp the rich spoil gathered from many a ransacked town was followed by the long line of captives the poor remains of the multitudes which had been carried off to furnish cruel sport for the citizens of syrian towns then came the pictured shows that filled the kindling fancy with the memories of glory strife and carnage the battle scenes the besieging lines the dread confusion of the storming armies the sky all aglow with the blazing temple and streams of blood flowing through the burning cities with each scene passed a captive leader to give reality to what men saw then came the sight most piteous to jewish eyes the plunder of the holy place the sacred vessels which profane hands had feared to touch before the golden table of the showbread the candlestick which may be still seen portrayed with its seven branching lamps by those who passed beneath the arch of titus after these came the images of victory and then the ruling powers of rome the father with the two sons who were in their turn to succeed him hour after hour passed away as the procession moved in stately splendour through the streets at last it wound along the sacred way which led up to the capitol and halted when the emperor stood at the door of the great temple of jupiter while he waited there the chief prisoner simon the son of Jorus, was dragged off with a noose about his neck to the dark prison not many steps away there was a silence of suspense while he was there buffeted and slain then the shout was raised that rome's enemy was no more the last sacrifices of the day were offered in the temple by vespasian and all was over the war thus closed was a legacy of nero's rule for the present government was one of peace happily the new emperor was a man of different stamp from any of the caesars who had gone before there had been fearful waste of treasure and the empire needed a good manager who would husband its resources and a quiet ruler who would soothe men's ruffled nerves vespasian was not a man of high ambition or heroic measures soldier as he was he was glad to sheath the sword but otherwise he carried to the palace the habits of earlier life he was simple and homely in his tastes affected no dignity kept little state and had no expensive pleasures much of the cruelty of previous monarchs grew out of their wanton waste the imperial revenue was small and their extravagance soon drained their coffers to replenish them they had recourse to rapine or judicial murder vespasian saw the need of strict economy to maintain his legions and the civil service to feed and amuse a population of proud paupers and to make good the ravages of fire and sword he needed a full treasury and there could be little left to spend upon himself but for himself he needed little 
he loved his little house among the sabine hills better than the palace of the caesars drank his wine with keener relish from his old grandmother's cup than from gold or silver goblets disliked parade or etiquette and could scarcely sit through the stately weariness of the triumphal show he mocked at the flatterers who thought to please his vanity by making hercules the founder of his race and unwillingly at alexandria submitted to test the virtue of his imperial hands on the blind who were brought to him to cure as in later days monarchs used to touch for the king's evil stories soon passed from mouth to mouth to show how he disliked luxurious habits a perfumed fop we read came to thank him for the promise of promotion but saw the great man turn away saying i would rather that you smelled of garlic and found his appointment cancelled after all but as ruler he never seemed content he said from the first that he must have a vast sum to carry on the government and he showed no lack of energy in raising it even at alexandria the first city to salute him emperor the people who looked for gratitude heard only of higher taxes in the place of bounty and vented their disgust in angry nicknames fresh tolls and taxes were imposed on every side by a financier who was indifferent to public talk or ridicule and shrank from no source of income however mean or unsavoury the name might seem if only it filled his coffers men remembered that his father had been tax-gatherer and usurer by turns and they said the son took after him when they saw their rulers stooping to unworthy traffic selling his favours and immunities bestowing honours on the highest bidder and prostituting as they fancied the justice of his courts of law it was said that he employed his mistress kindness as a go-between in such degrading business and that he allowed his fiscal agents to enrich themselves by greed and fraud stepping in at last to take the spoil and draining them like sponges dry the wits of rome of course amused themselves at his expense and told their stories of his want of dignity a servant one day asked him for a favour for one whom he called his brother the emperor sent at once to call the suitor to him made him pay him down the sum which he had promised to his friend at court and then when the servant came again to ask the favour said in answer look out for another brother for he whom you call yours is now mine another time a deputation came to tell him that a town had voted a costly statue in his honour set it up at once he said and holding out the hollow of his hand here is the base all ready to receive it there was indeed nothing royal in his talk or manners he freely indulged in vulgar banter and was never it is said in a gayer mood than when he had hit upon some sordid trick for raising money of such tales many perhaps were mere idle talk the spleen of men who thought it hard to be called upon to pay their quota to the expenses of the state the money was certainly well used however it was gotten government was carried on with a strong though thrifty hand and peace and order were everywhere secured liberal grants were made to cities in which fire and earthquake had made havoc senators were provided with means to support their rank and old families saved from ruin by timely generosity the fine arts and liberal studies were encouraged public professorships were founded and endowed out of the emperor's privy purse nor were the amusements of the people overlooked though his outlay on this score seemed mean and parsimonious as compared with the extravagance of nero it was the great merit of vespasian that absolute power had no disturbing influence on his judgment or his temper he had no suspicious fears but let his door stand open to all comers through the day and dropped the earlier habit of the court of searching those who entered he showed no jealousy of great men round him and treated musianus with forbearance though his patience was sorely tried by his haughty airs he was in no haste to assert his dignity and when demetrius the cynic kept his seat and vented some rude speech as he came near him he only called him a snarling cur and passed on his way in one case indeed he was persuaded to take harsher measures halvidius priscus the son-in-law of thrasia Pitus, had from the first asserted in the most offensive forms 
his claims to republican equality. He spoke of his prince by name without a title or rank or honor. As praetor he ignored him in all official acts, and treated him when they met with almost cynical contempt. He was not content seemingly to be let alone, but aspired to be a martyr to his stoic dogmas. Vespasian was provoked at last to give the order for his death, recalling it indeed soon after, but only to be told that it was too late to save him, for Titus and his chief advisers felt the danger from the philosophic malcontents, saw how much of their policy of abstention had weakened the government of Nero, and were resolved that Halvidius should die, though at the cost of Vespasian's regret and self-reproach. There was also another scene, and one too of unusual pathos, in which he acted sternly. Julius Sabinus was a chieftain of the Lingones, who called his clan to arms for Gallic independence. The movement failed, the Sequani against whom he marched having defeated him. He heard that the Roman eagles were at hand, and in despair the would-be Caesar burnt his house over his head and hid himself in a dark cave in hope that men might think him dead. His wife Eponina believed he was no more, and gave way to such an agony of grief that he sent a trusty messenger to tell her all and bid her join him. For years she lived in the town by day among her unsuspecting friends, and in the hours of darkness with her husband. She began to hope that she might free them both from the weariness of this concealment if she could but go to Rome and win his pardon. She dared not leave him in his hiding place alone, so she took him with her in disguise. But the long journey was a fruitless one. The boon was never granted. Sadly and wearily they made their way back to their hiding place to carry on the old life of disguise and suspense. Then, to make her trial harder, she bore two children to her husband. She hid her state from every eye, hid her little ones even from her friends, suckled and reared them for some time in that dark cave with their father. At length the secret was discovered, and the whole family was carried off to hear their sentence from Vespasian's lips. In vain she asked for mercy, in vain she pleaded that the rash presumption of a moment had been atoned for by long years of lingering suspense, in vain she brought her little ones to lisp with their infant lips the cry for pity, till the emperor's heart was touched, and he was ready to relent. But Titus stood by and was seemingly unmoved. He urged that it would be a dangerous example to let any hope for mercy who had showed such high ambition, and that state policy required that they should die. Unable to save her husband, the noble-hearted woman bore him company in death, and left the emperor's presence with defiance on her lips. Vespasian was soon to follow her. He had passed ten years of sovereignty and sixty-nine of life. His career as a ruler had been one of unremitting toil, and even when his powers began to fail, he would not give himself more rest. Physicians warned him that he must slacken work and change the order of his daily life, but an emperor, he said, should die upon his feet, and he was busy with the cares of office almost to the last. His jesting humor did not leave him even on his deathbed, and as the streams of life were ebbing, he thought of the divine honors given to the earlier Caesars and said, I feel that I am just going to be a god. Nor did the populace forget to jest in their sorrow at his death. When the funeral rites were going on, an actor was seen to personate the dead man by his dress and bearing, and to ask the undertaker how much the funeral cost. When a large sum was named, Give me the hundredth part of it, Vespasian was made to say, and fling my body into the Tiber. End of section 18